Okay, how's it going, folks? Turn a little light on there. Uh, welcome, Chuck Holton here, uh, coming to you uh, uh, about noon on December 20th, uh, 2023. This is uh, the East Coast of America. I'm coming to you from my lodge in West Virginia, and we're going to talk about what's happening in Israel and can Israel win? Uh, and you might think that's a foregone conclusion, but it really is not. Not yet. We don't. Uh, we we cannot say with any absolute certainty yet whether or not Israel will win this. And let's talk about why. Uh, so, first of all, I'd like to know where you're all coming in from. If you haven't yet, uh, please put your uh, where you're watching from in the comments. Uh, I love hearing from from people. And I also wanted to say that if you contacted my wife, me or my wife, about uh, getting one of my books signed uh, yesterday, please be patient because we got hundreds of requests and uh, we're not going to be able to fulfill all of those. We ran out of books very quickly. I didn't realize so many people would want copies of them. You can still get copies of most of my books on um, uh, Amazon.com or anywhere like that. And I do have audio versions. If you'd like to get an audio version of uh, my last two books, Making Men or Prowess, you can get those at uh, by, by just sending an email asking for them. Um, you can go to, uh, well, let's see. I guess maybe I could put a link or something up on chuckholton.com. If you go to chuckholton.com, you can see some of the videos and articles that I will be referencing today. I'm uh, really not able to put too much up on these videos because they get demonetized. Uh, yesterday's video on uh, the, uh, well, what we talked about yesterday was that uh, the settler problem in Israel, how settlers are uh, being blamed for violence that's not actually taking place. And uh, it was apparently immediately throttled by uh, YouTube because we got very low views on that uh, compared to what we normally get, even though we had uh, the same number of people online that we normally do. And so it, it appears to me that YouTube is throttling that because we're talking about uh, the settlers in Gaza. And um, so if you don't mind, go and either, if you haven't watched it, watch it or share it uh, with your friends because it's an important video. And I did want to just follow up with it really quick. One of the things we talked about is that, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration is, and, and the world body, the United Nations, are using the uh, issue of uh, supposed violence against Palestinians in the West Bank by settlers, by, by Jewish or Israeli uh, people living there. They're living there legally not illegally. The, the world will tell you they're illegal. They're not. Um, they're, they're, they are breaking no laws in the country where they live. <clears throat> no more than me having a deer rifle here in West Virginia would make me illegal. It, the UN might like to make it illegal, but uh, according to the laws of the state where I live, it's completely legal for me to have it. And so uh, that's the same issue in uh, the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. <clears throat> now, I told people yesterday, if you happen to come across any kind of article, any kind of proof that there is violence against Palestinians by Jewish settlers, I'd like to see it. And some people did send me a article uh, about settler violence, supposed settler violence, and it is in a uh, a town uh, which I can't really uh, pronounce very well, Termus Aya, T U R M U S A Y Y A, Termus Aya. Um, and so that what they the article says is a Time Magazine article that says that hundreds of Israelis rampaged through the town of Termus Aya. Uh, this last week, last Wednesday, um, and they, oh wait, was that last Wednesday? Uh, look at the date. Oh, no, this is back in June. 
Uh, okay, so this is not even recent. Uh, it's back in June. And they're, they're, they rampage through this town of Termosaya, uh, torching cars and homes, etc., etc. Now, what I said yesterday was that the majority of the killings that are taking place in the West Bank are not actually uh, settlers. They are IDF troops who are policing the area uh, of terrorists, Hamas-affiliated people, uh, and people who attack them when they go in there to serve these warrants or to uh, take out a Hamas terrorist or something like that. So you've got these, um, you know, let's say the IDF has a mission to go into Nablus or, uh, you know, Ramallah or someplace like that and uh, serve a warrant on a house there that supposedly has some uh, leaders of Hamas or some uh, Hamas affiliated people or some terrorists or whatever in it. While they are in the process of that mission, uh, people come out of their homes and congregate around there and start throwing rocks at them. And then some people start shooting at them from among the civilians who are throwing rocks. Uh, the IDF shoots back, some civilians get killed, and this is what is lumped in by the Biden administration as settler violence. Only it's not. It's not settler violence. Uh, in this case, from last June, uh, this Palestinian town of Termosaya was, uh, it did have some unrest there. And first of all, you, the first thing you notice when you start to read the article is that this happened in response to the murder of four Israeli citizens, civilians including a 17-year-old boy n near that town by people who lived in that town. And so the people who lived in the town where the four Israeli civilians came from came to that town to protest the killing of these Israeli civilians. Most of the people that were there were there protesting peacefully. Um, they were angry. A few people got uh, out of hand, mob mentality being what it is, and started to, to burn cars and, and that sort of thing. Um, it took the IDF a while to get there. The IDF came not to attack the Palestinians, but to stop the rioting that was taking place by the Israelis. Now, there were several hundred people. I'm, what I'm told is that of the several hundred people, there were maybe a dozen who were actually getting rowdy. The rest were just there protesting. Um, as I, as I looked into this more, you can read several different articles and you start to pick out interesting uh, people, okay? Uh, or, I mean, interesting facts about what actually happened. Uh, I don't think, for example, Time Magazine or the AP uh, wants to really tell the whole truth about what happened, but you can read between the lines a little bit and start to understand, A, this was done because they were very angry about four Israeli civilians being murdered by people in that town. And B, uh, what you find when you start to read into it a little more is that there was only one Palestinian killed and that was somebody who Hamas claimed was one of their fighters. So he was a, he was a shahed. He was a martyr for Hamas and he was not killed by Israeli civilians. He was killed by the IDF while he was shooting at the IDF, okay? So, but this incident, we've had since then, since June, this is before the war started, we've had people from Black Lives Matter, we've had people from, um, uh, you know, nations all around the world who are coming to uh, show solidarity with these uh, apparent, apparently, you know, uh, persecuted Palestinians, only these Palestinians are not being persecuted. Uh, they're not in any way, shape, or form. And so if they're not being persecuted, well then, the problem is with the Palestinians, it's not with the Israelis. All right? Uh, wow, we've got a lot of comments coming through. Uh, and there's one that needs to go. And we'll just hide that user. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, okay, so uh, this guy, Ali Khabar, 
is saying uh, 20,000 dead, okay? Well, there are not 20,000 dead. Um, there are, uh, the, the numbers of 20,000 are being released by Hamas, uh, which is, oh great, Black Lives Matter showed up. Okay, well, we'll put these users in. We'll hide these users. Um, so we're going to get rid of the Black Lives Matter crowd uh, because they're ridiculous. Um, so what you find every time that you hear the U.S. government excoriating Israel for not doing more about quote-unquote settler violence against the uh, Palestinians is that it's actually Palestinian violence against the settlers and it is the IDF enforcing the law in the places where they are legally supposed to enforce the law, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Now, let's go on and let's talk about what's happening with the war. I'm going to need some, uh, some tea. I'm going to Send my wife a message and tell her to get in here, woman, and give me some tea. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. It's a joke. Uh, I, I, I wear the pants in this family, uh, whichever pair she tells me I can put on. And so, uh, but she is a wonderful, wonderful helper and is <clears throat> very kind to bring me tea when I need it. Because uh, coffee is not doing the job for helping my voice here today. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on. Uh, the fighting is still very severe in Gaza. Uh, what I found, what we're finding, is that the vast majority of the civilians in Gaza have now moved down to Rafa, to the Rafa crossing. So they're plastered up against the fence, uh, down in the farthest south they can go, and they want to get across the fence, but. Egypt is not letting them, and the aid that was coming in from Egypt uh, was being stolen by, uh, by Hamas. There's lots of video of that. There's some on my website, chuckholton.com. You can go watch of uh, Hamas fighters stealing the truckloads full of aid as they come into uh, to Gaza and not giving them out to the people who need them but keeping them for themselves. Now, the IDF has stationed a force down in Rafa. This cannot be good, um, very good uh, duty, for sure. Very dangerous to be down there. But they've stationed a force at the border crossing in Rafa to keep that from happening, to allow the civilians in Gaza to get the aid that they need. Um, but we're being told that uh, Hamas is trying to prevent the aid from even coming into Gaza now uh, from the Egyptian side. Now, I, I'm not sure how that works exactly. That would uh, make one think that perhaps Hamas has a presence in Egypt, which Egypt would not go for. But uh, So I've heard two competing stories. One, that the IDF is down there at the Rafa gate, to, to ensure that aid gets in and that Hamas is trying to stop the aid from coming in at all. Why? Why would they do that? Ask yourself why Hamas would try to stop the aid from entering if they can't have it. Well, it's because their greatest weapon. What kind of weapons does Hamas have in Gaza? Well, they've got... Hamas has rifles, they have grenades, they have rockets... They have anti-tank guided missiles. They have drones and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Mortars, uh, things like that. But their greatest weapon is the Palestinian people, is the, the people that are trying to flee this conflict. If they can continue to weaponize the people of Gaza against Israel they might actually have a chance of survival. And this is why I, I titled this talk, um, Can Israel Win? Uh, they have the will to win, without a doubt. 
but do they have the wherewithal? Uh, here's, here's why I say that, okay? Uh, Israel is facing seven pressures that are all converging on it, that are all ramping up. So the pressure is converging on Israel from all sides right now. Uh, first of all, they have pressure from their own public. Uh, the pressure from their own public is rising, even though the majority of Israelis still believe that Israel must do what it has to do to finish this fight and make Israel safe. The amount of pressure from the public is rising to stop the fighting in order to get more hostages out. That has come in the face of uh, the, this mounting pressure comes as Israel has killed some of the hostages, some of them have been murdered and, and or executed by Hamas, and Hamas is now putting out videos of the, some of the remaining hostages. So they put out a video uh, yesterday of three of the remaining hostages who are older guys and forced them to read a script into the camera that is meant to put additional pressure, thank you, my dear, uh, on, on Israel. So they're facing increasing public pressure to go to the negotiating table. That pressure is also mounting from the international community, the United States and others, uh, as the leader of Hamas has left, just uh, yesterday left Qatar and has flown to Egypt to continue talks for another ceasefire. The United States uh, Defense Secretary, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, who was in Israel yesterday, has uh, w was talking very much about this, that we, they want to see another humanitarian pause uh, so that they can do more uh, negotiating to try to put an end to this fight. And that humanitarian pause would almost be the death knell to Israel's mission to destroy Hamas. Uh, if they can come up with another humanitarian pause. The last one allowed Hamas to regroup, rearm, refit, rest, and plan further attacks against the IDF. The level of combat, the level of uh, response of, of, of fighting against the IDF ramped up significantly after that ceasefire ended. And so have we got some trolls in there. I'm hoping we've got some, uh, some people that are moderating. But if I need to moderate, I can. Uh, okay, so um, that international pressure is not something that Israel can afford to ignore. The, you know how the UN Security Council works? Back in the war in uh, 1967, the Six-Day War, Jerusalem was owned by the Jordanians. You know, was was administered and controlled by the Jordanians. The Israelis did not have uh, the old city of Jerusalem, and they were making progress toward the old city of Jerusalem when the UN. Security Council started voting on a ceasefire. And Israel knew that if the UN Security Council voted for there to be a ceasefire, they would have to stop fighting. That's how much power the UN Security Council has had over Israel in the prosecution of its wars. And so they had to go all out in 1967 there, back in, in June, I think it was June 7th of 1967, they had to go all out to try to reach the old city of Jerusalem and take it before the UN Security Council declared a ceasefire. And it, it might be weird to you, as it is to me, like how can a, uh, a, a, an international body have any say over what a sovereign country can and cannot do in trying to protect its people? Well, 
That's because the UN Security Council has enough teeth because they can put three, total, three distinct kinds of pressure on Israel if Israel were to refuse to stop fighting if they pass a ceasefire resolution. They can, pass, they, they can bring diplomatic pressure to, to bear on Israel. They can bring sanctions to bear on Israel. And they could actually bring military uh, pressure to bear by sending in UN peacekeepers uh, to stop the fighting. And Israel being a modern democratic country, a, a, a member of the United Nations, they have agreed uh, to abide by the wishes of the UN Security Council. Now, the UN Security Council already voted for a ceasefire in this war, and it was vetoed by the United States, who has permanent veto ability uh, over that, that body. But the question is, how long will they continue to do that? The United States is continuing to ramp up the pressure on Israel, even though they're, they're saying, we still stand by you, we understand you have the right to protect your, your country, but we, we really want you to stop fighting. You really need to stop fighting. And the, they're watching the support of the United States be eroded little by little. So at some point, it, it flips over, and the United States starts saying, we can't support you anymore in this. And they stop. If the United States did not veto a resolution for a ceasefire by the UN, essentially Israel would have to stop fighting. And so in a way, the United States has got Israel and they, they do have quite a bit of control over what Israel decides to do. Uh, now, most of the American public still supports Israel in continuing to fight, according to studies that have been done. And most of the Israeli public does. But as I say, those numbers are shifting. They're slowly shifting, and they're not shifting in the favor of Israel. So that's bad. Now, you also have logistical pressures that are ramping up on Israel. As they continue to fight, they've got to continue to find ammunition to fight with. And they've got to continue to find rockets uh, uh, to um, shoot down uh, missiles that are coming in from the north and from the south. Those Iron Dome missiles cost about $50,000 a pop. And they are, uh, you know, not running out yet because they are still being supplied by the United States. But again, um, they, they are watching the amount of military material that they have go down and that pressure that puts stress on the system, right? Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult for them to do what they need to do. And now they also have economic pressure because it, when you're in Israel, uh, what you'll notice is that a lot of stuff is still shut down because so many people are, have been called up uh, to fight in this war. And so uh, there is a tremendous economic pressure on Israel to finish this fight because if they don't, um, it, it is really going to take years for their economy to recover. It already is uh, from this. Uh, and uh, we've been talking about this a lot since the very beginning, but that pressure is continuing to mount. Now, if you started charting these, and if you started putting together a, a, a diagram where you started to chart these pressures, there comes a point where they all start to intersect up here, and that is the tipping point where the economic pressure, the diplomatic pressure, the, the uh, logistical pressure, the international pressure, and the public pressure from their own people gets so great that Israel has to stop fighting. And if that point comes before Israel has finished the job, well, then they lose. They, they will not win. This, the Hamas will survive, and they will continue, they will rebuild, and they will attack Israel again. Just yesterday, Hamas made a show of force by firing dozens and dozens of missiles out of 
Gaza. And what we saw was this in Tel Aviv, central Israel. That's a lot of rockets, folks. So Hamas is fighting hard. They've been preparing for this battle for years. So they are fighting very hard. Okay, what's Marguerite's question? Chuck, so somebody says, Chuck, I just saw that go by. Uh, let's see if I can back up here and find it. How about uh, somebody repost the question down at the bottom and put it in all caps. If the, if the questions aren't in all caps, then it's really hard to catch them as they go by. Um, today in Israel, there are more rockets being fired but they are up in the north near Kiryat Shimona, and so that means that they're coming from Hezbollah. Um, with my mom and dad, my dad would always say he got... Okay, so if you're not writing a question, please don't put them in all caps if you're just making a comment. Can Israel use weapons from Hamas? Uh, okay, get at, I get asked that a lot. Uh, the answer is no, for the most part. Most of the weapons that they're capturing... Now, I put... I'll put photos of some of the weapons uh, over on my channel. I mean, on, uh, on uh, ChuckHolton.com. If you go to ChuckHolton.com, you can see videos of the, uh, the fighting that's going on in Gaza that I'm putting up, and I'll put pictures up of some of the weapons that they are capturing. I, maybe I need to explain this a little better because I get asked this question a lot. Uh, you can download the app. It's called Sofar, T-Z-O-F-A-R, and it looks like that red one right there, T-Z-O-F-A-R. That's the app that I'm looking at that shows you the rocket launches out of Israel. Um, there are two main types of weapons in the world. There are NATO standard weapons, and there are uh, Soviet standard weapons from the old Soviet Union. NATO standard weapons are like M16s, AR15s, M4s, um, you know, weapons that fire the NATO standard 5.56 millimeter uh, ammunition. And, and then that expands to rocket, uh, anti-tank rocket uh, and light anti-tank rockets and uh, mortars and artillery and even drones and bombs and stuff. They all have their own standard as far as, you know, what they weigh, what size they are, et cetera, et cetera. When you, when you look at Soviet standard weapons, you have there, it's a different caliber of ammunition. It's instead of 5.56 millimeter, it's 7.62 millimeter, or what we would call here in America, 308. Uh, in in America, we'd call NATO standard 223. That's caliber, uh, but 308 caliber or or 7.62 caliber is larger and not compatible. The ammunition's not compatible. So what you don't want is your soldiers running around on the battlefield, and one of them's got a 308, and one of them's got a 5.56, and they get in a firefight, and one of them runs out of ammunition and says, "Hey, buddy, give me some ammo." And he says, "I can't. It doesn't fit. You got the wrong weapon." They want everybody to be standardized so that everybody uses the same ammunition. And that goes for everything else, whether it's rockets, whether it's uh, mortars, whether it's grenades. Uh, they want everything to be standardized. And so here's something that's very interesting about this. If you look at propaganda videos that are put out by Hamas, what you will find, uh, Lisa, I made a gigantic... Uh, bonfire out in my backyard to burn some yard waste the other day and a, an ash came down and burned me right there on the, my head. That's what happened to my head. Uh, so I have a little burn there. Um, thank you for asking. <laughs> People comment on my nose hair, my mustache. My, uh, uh, okay, we're talking about weapons here, all right? Um, <laughs> thank you for caring. Um, so the the ammunition... That, and I'm sorry, the weapons that you see in Hamas propaganda videos tend to be NATO standard weapons. It shows Hamas fighters carrying the same kind of weapons that the IDF carries. And that's strange because when you look at the weapons that the IDF is capturing as they move through Gaza, 
they're, by and large, they're all Soviet standard weapons, not NATO standard weapons. So why is Hamas putting NATO standard weapons in their propaganda videos? Well, number one, because they're better weapons, they're, they're uh, better quality weapons. Uh, and that's arguable. I'm not going to get into an argument about that, about that. But suffice it to say, many people in the world think that NATO standard weapons are better. And number two, most of those NATO standard weapons that the IDF, I mean, that Hamas carries were captured from the IDF in attacks. And so it's a way of kind of poking the IDF in the eye and saying, ha ha, we stole your weapons. But when you find actual Hamas fighters, they're not using NATO standard weapons. They're using weapons from Soviet days, which are older, worse shape, and in many cases, homemade uh, knockoffs made in Gaza. Now, you don't want to give homemade knockoff weapons to the IDF because, A, they probably have not trained on how to use those, so they might, I mean, you know, it's possible you could hurt yourself if you don't know how to use those things, and B, they're not compatible with what you already have. Does that make sense? I, I, I keep answering that question. I hope I answered it well enough this time. You kind of understand what I mean. So most of the weapons, if they capture weapons that once belonged to the, to the IDF that were stolen by Hamas, then yes, they probably are reintegrating those into their uh, materiel and reissuing them out to people uh, so that they can use them. But if they're capturing homemade weapons or weapons that were bought from China, North Korea, Russia, someplace like that, then they probably put them in a really big hole and throw a hand grenade in there and blow them all up. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Okay. Could Israel still flood the tunnels if the war ends? No. If they have a ceasefire, then they would probably have to stop flooding the tunnels. That's a very good question. Thank you for that. Uh, do you think Hamas got a hold of some of the gear and weapons we left behind in Afghanistan? Very, very good question, one tired mama. Um, I don't think so. I, am, I initially did uh, when the war started and I saw all these Hamas videos of these guys running around with uh, M4s. I thought, oh my goodness, some of those things made their way from Afghanistan to Hamas. But uh, I, I have now talked to uh, people who are in Gaza and who are picking these weapons up. And what they're telling me is that the majority of the NATO standard weapons that they're picking up were actually weapons that were captured from the IDF uh, during the October 7th attack. And so they have not found many that came from elsewhere. And um, I don't believe... Uh, now, those weapons are durable and fungible. We left $86 billion worth of weapons in Afghanistan when we pulled out in that tragedy uh, a couple years ago. And those weapons will make their way around the world eventually. Uh, but so far, there's not a lot of them that have made it to Gaza. And... Um, Okay, so that hopefully answers that question. With those rockets being fired, how safe are the people targeted? Uh, I think you mean the Israelis that are being targeted. Uh, there have not been a lot of injuries or deaths from those rockets because A, most of the rockets are unguided and they just fall in farmer's fields and stuff. If you go to Israel, what you'll see is that there's a lot of open land, a lot that's not even farmed. It's just open land. But there's also a lot of farmland and agriculture. And Israel's system is so good that when they see a rocket being launched out of Gaza, they can, in seconds, calculate where that is going to land. And they can decide whether or not it's likely to hurt anybody. If it's not likely to hurt anybody because it's going to land in, in some farmer's field or something, they just let it go. And it just blows up out in, in the field. If it is going to land in a built-up area, then they put out the, the alert on Shofar and tell people to head for the shelter. Everybody runs to the shelter, and then they shoot these anti-missile missiles at the rockets that are coming in, and most of them get shot down. About 90% plus get shot down. And so then you only have to worry about debris 
not actual explosives coming down on you because the explosive gets blown up, but then it's just metal debris, chunks of stuff. I've got a piece right here. Uh, this is a piece of a rocket that came down, um, you know, in, in the road uh, when I was in southern Israel a few weeks ago, and I picked it up out of the road and brought it home. I think this is actually a piece of one of the Iron Dome rockets uh, because it's very well made. This is not a homemade uh, rocket, uh, and it's fairly intact. And you can see where there's a pivot point right here where this would have allowed it to steer. Those uh, Iron Dome rockets are very maneuverable, and they use fins like this to steer themselves and, and, and you know, head off the unguided missiles, which are usually have welded, um, uh, I don't have one here, that, but they have, they have fins on them that are welded on. They don't have a pivot point on them like this. So I believe that this came from a uh, Iron Dome rocket. Uh, and I just stuck it in my bag and brought it home because I have a very nice collection of uh, uh, various different kinds of shrapnel. This came from Mikolaiv uh, in, from Ukraine uh, last year from a Russian caliber missile. And I've got a big piece of... Uh, this came from Stepanakert in uh, Armenia. Uh, this is from a, uh, an artillery shell. This is really nasty stuff, very heavy uh, lead rocket. That's not from a rocket. That's from an um, artillery piece. I've got one up here from a drone. This is a um, Shahed drone that came from Ukraine. This is a, a fin uh, on it. Uh, this also came from uh, uh, Mikolaiv area. Uh, but these, they're using these drones against Israel as well. Uh, and they're the ones that are, they're about the size of a desk, uh, maybe a little bit larger. And they have a, I think a 13 kilogram or maybe a 30 kilogram warhead on them. You know, they're, they're not big enough to take out a building unless it's a very small one. Um, I mean, they might take out a house, you know, um, they, they might make a house unlivable, but they're not going to vaporize the house like a bigger bomb would. Um, so I keep the, these because I'm super cheap and I don't like to buy souvenirs. And so I just collect junk from the war zones that I go to. And, uh, there you go. All right. Let's see if we got any other questions here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> that nose hair blocks coronavirus. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. What about Hamas rocket salvos? Hamas continues to develop crude rocket technology. Uh, and yeah, they target, they, they reach major Israel. So that's right. Hamas has been firing those rockets. They build them out of water pipes and street uh, light poles on the, on the street. They take down the light poles and cut them up and make rockets out of them. They're very crude, they're unguided, and about 20% of them actually misfire and fall inside Gaza and kill Gazans. Uh, how did I bring those shrapnels to the USA? I put them in my suitcase and bring them home. Uh, sometimes they get taken away, sometimes they don't. Is the laser defense weapons operational? Uh, not in Gaza. The laser defense is a prototype uh, system that the IDF is testing and they are still testing it as far as I know. I've not seen it in um, common use or uh, any, they've just a few times it has been used that I know of. Does the IDF have anything like counter battery fire where they can immediately deter determine the firing point? Um, they do have that for, I, I don't want to give away too much. Uh, they, they do have some Counter-battery fire, that's not a secret. Um, Counter-battery fire, for those who don't understand, the United States has this uh, setup where it, there's like a, some sometimes listening devices and sometimes um, radar, actual radar, that triangulates when a rocket or a artillery shell or a mortar shell or even a gunshot gets fired, triangulates the source of it, and immediately 
has a uh, mortar round loaded into a tube that's on a platform that's run by a computer that immediately goes whoop and fires right back. And so within a second of some of them firing a mortar round, when I was in Afghanistan, you saw this a lot, the enemy would fire a mortar round and before their mortar round impacted, our mortar round would already be going back the, the direction that it came and would take out uh, the, the firing point. So they have literally seconds to get to cover once they fire a mortar round at you. Um, that counter battery fire is different than counter missile fire, than the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome is meant to shoot down the rocket that's incoming. Counter battery fire is meant to take out the guys who fired the missile. And they, they do have some kinds of that. They are blanketing Gaza with uh, aerial surveillance and things like that now. Um, but I don't think they have stuff like the United States does uh, that would, it, within uh, you know seconds, shoot back at them, at least not from a long range. So the, the missiles that they're firing out of Gaza typically travel five miles or more, right? Or they're at least meant to. Uh, if they do their job, they're going to fire, uh, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles into Israel. Um, and so if they're going to like Tel Aviv out of Gaza, those rockets would take a couple of minutes to get there, or at least over a minute. So... I don't think that the IDF has got counter battery fire that could shoot back at them within seconds. Um, and it wouldn't be that effective anyway, because they would still take a couple minutes to fly back unless they were shooting it from within Gaza, which they may be doing. Um, that's a very good question though. Do Palestinians know their funds are used for terror? Of course they do. They're, they're the ones that are using it for terror. What happened to the CNN journalist who broke in with Hamas from October 7th? Uh, as far as I know, he's still in Gaza. Uh, a couple of those guys, because there were more than one, a couple of those guys have been killed in Gaza uh, reporting. You know, they're supposedly reporting, uh, but they, they're essentially, you know, combat cameramen for Hamas, which makes them legitimate combatants. Um, if they entered Israel illegally on October 7th, then they are legit targets, little combat targets for the IDF. And the IDF has threatened to take out anybody who came in illegally to Israel on October 7th, whether or not they were carrying a gun. Now, one other thing I wanted to point out is that um, they, they detained the director of another one of the hospitals in Gaza and interviewed him, and they put out the interview. Uh, and you can go watch it. And one of the things he said was that he admitted that uh, there were people working in his hospital, doctors and medical personnel working in his hospital who were active members of the Qassam Brigades, which is the military arm of Hamas. So, I mean, if those guys are working in the hospital and they're active members of the Qassam Brigades, that makes the hospital a legitimate military target. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not, it's becoming it's to the point where it's not even a surprise now to find out that Hamas is using civilian places like hospitals, mosques, schools, you know, whatever, uh, as military facilities, but there's just more and more proof coming out every day that they are doing so. Uh, okay, let's see here. Is... Is there a truce deal currently on the table? Um, well, there are talks going on right now in Egypt between uh, Egypt, Qatar, uh, the United States, and Israel. And they are trying to come up with a new ceasefire or at least a humanitarian pause. But the distance between them is much wider than it was the last time. So Israel is saying, um, well, we'll talk, but we've got to get all of our, uh, we want all of our hostages, all of them back. 
and um, or at the very least, all of the females that are left in, in custody. And Hamas is saying, we're not releasing any more hostages until the fighting has stopped completely. Well, that's pretty far apart. And so uh, the United States and Egypt and Qatar are bargaining really, really hard with both Hamas and, and Israel, trying to come up with another ceasefire, uh, but it's not really happening. They have scheduled another vote of the UN Security Council, which would be a binding vote for to force a ceasefire. Um, but how do you force a ceasefire on Hamas? Because they're not going to listen to that. Uh, you can only force a ceasefire on Israel because Hamas is not a member of the United Nations. And so Hamas is going to keep fighting and keep shooting rockets. And so what that means is you can you can uh, define that as the UN uh, Security Council is going to hold a vote to try to force Israel to lose the war. That's what they're voting on. Was the Nova Festival not too close to Gaza? Well, apparently it was too close to Gaza uh, because <laughs> it was uh, targeted and three, more than 360 people died there. Uh, have they found the woman... They took in the Jeep. No, they have not. She's still one of those being held. Can't Israel demand an unconditional surrender of Hamas to the UN? Well, they can demand whatever they want. But again, the UN Security Council does have some teeth when it comes to trying to force Israel to lose the war. And so far, Israel is like, nope, we're not going to stop no matter what. But what they're doing is they're keeping an eye on the public uh, pressure from the Israeli citizens that is being levied against them. And as that ramps up, especially as they accidentally kill uh, some of their own hostages, now one other, excuse me, one other uh, thing came out, bit of news about those three hostages that were killed. It turns out that an Israeli uh, canine uh, dog, military working dog, was sent out to run around in that area with a camera on and actually filmed those three hostages asking for help. Like, you know, ran by and they were like, help us, help us, in Hebrew, on the video. But unfortunately, that dog was killed on that mission and nobody bothered to look at the video until much later after the hostages had already been killed. If they had looked at that video right away, they would have known that those guys were free and they would have been able to rescue them. It just keeps getting more and more unfortunate. Uh, it's terrible. But to Israel's credit, they're not hiding it. They're not sweeping that under the rug. Even though it makes them look bad, they are putting it out. They're being transparent about it. And that's what, at that's what a righteous army does. Question, why wouldn't Israel eliminate the Hamas leader that's in Egypt right now? Well, I, you know, the protocol is if he comes to talk uh, ceasefire, we're not going to kill him while he's there. He's going to have to have, um, you know, a guarantee of safe passage for that. Uh, but I wouldn't put anything past the Mossad. The Mossad has said, this guy's a dead man walking. We are going to kill him. And I believe they will. Uh, when they do it, they're going to choose a time and place. But uh, why wouldn't Israel? Okay, so we got that part. Israel needs to keep an eye. Maybe you can help me pray for peace. Um, yeah, they, the guy obviously thought those three guys were um, uh, were, were um, Hamas fighters. They look like Hamas fighters. And... Um, so, yeah. Okay, this guy needs to go. And this guy in Arabic needs to go. What else we got here? Can Israel win alone? Boy, Jeff, that's the question, isn't it? That's the tough question. Uh that is the, the million-dollar question here. Can Israel win if they have to go it alone? If they, going it alone means 
that they would have to defy the UN Security Council, which would essentially make Israel a pariah internationally. And there would be some real fallout to that, most likely in the form of sanctions. Uh, and so in that case, a victory does not quite look like a, as much of a victory because you still have the economic impact of fighting the war even after the war is over. Um, so that's, let's hope that, that we don't have to find out. How about that? Will Israel be in big trouble when the church is raptured? <laughs> uh, how about we talk about that on a different day over on my channel? Folks, if you uh, have not yet done so, please go subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton. Uh, today I did a, a, a hour and a plus uh, hot zone about immigration and explained in detail why the immigration problem is about to get much, much worse in the United States over the next year or two. Uh, we're going to see this immigration problem get quite a bit worse because of some changes that are happening in Latin America right now. And I, I explained all of that on the live that I did today on my channel. You can go watch it right as soon as this one is done. Uh, the Hot Zone with Chuck Holton. Also, uh, I'm answering a lot of these uh, questions people are asking that are not, do not pertain to the topic. Um, and I am putting them over at chuckholton.com on my locals page. You can go and subscribe uh, on, uh, on chuckholton.com and get lots of additional information, including videos that illustrate what we're talking about here. Somebody asked if there are Palestinians with red hair. There are a few. I've seen some, um, and they are striking. Not maybe as red as that uh, one hostage had, but uh, you can imagine his hair was pretty dirty and the fog of war being what it is. Um, it's, it's just a really unfortunate event that took place when they ended up killing those three guys. Um, why doesn't the UN make Russia stop the war they're in? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and here's the answer. Uh, boss man, Russia has veto power over the UN Security Council, just like the United States does. So the UN Security Council has voted multiple times to try to force Russia to stop the war. And Russia has vetoed it every time. Um, and so removing Russia from the UN Security Council is not that easy because there are still a bunch of uh, countries that would support Russia. And so they're kind of just stuck there. But they have passed a lot of sanctions against Russia. Um, and those sanctions are biting, for sure. Let's see. Does Israel believe in Jesus Christ? Uh, you're, you're asking if a country, a country cannot believe in Jesus Christ. Israelis, by and large, do not. Um, some, there are about 2% of Israelis, a little less, who are Christian. Uh, but... And I guess you could say that the Muslims believe that there was someone named Jesus Christ, but they don't believe that he is the Messiah. And neither do Jews, uh, for the most part. Can Israel leave the UN, and what are the ramifications? I suppose they could. Uh, the ramifications would be pretty severe on, on Israel. That would uh, make Israel something of a pariah, state, and um, that would not be good. Um, I don't think that they're willing to do that. Let's put it that way, okay? Yeah, a lot of people say, why doesn't Israel just leave the UN? Uh, we've asked that about the United States multiple times too, considering that the United States pays about 28% of the UN's total budget, and most of the things the UN does are not good for America. One might wonder why the United States doesn't just pull out of it altogether. The answer is because by doing so, we remove ourselves from the world stage that much more, and that gives power to the people who stay there, like Russia and China. You know, I mean, so if Russia and China stay in the UN and we pull out, well, then what we're doing is giving more power over to them, and we don't want to do that. When am I going back to Israel? We'll see after the first of the year. Um, I'm not going anywhere until after the first year, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. Let's see. 
Why do the other Muslim nations not like the Palestinians? Well, um, A, because the Palestinians are uh, violent. B, because uh, the other Muslim nations feel like by taking in Palestinians, they would be helping Israel and they want to weaponize those Palestinians against Israel, and they can't do that if they relieve the pressure on the situation by taking them out of Gaza, okay? Any news on the women killed in the church by the IDF sniper? Uh, no, the IDF is looking into that. I haven't heard any uh, thing. Okay, let's see. I probably will go back to Israel, but I'm gonna let my viewers decide over on the hot zone I'm going to give them three options after the first of the year uh, and let them decide what I go report on next. So if you want to have a vote, go subscribe on the Hot Zone and you can vote when I run that poll. Um, I'm 56, never knew this much of religion and war, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Question, if captured, will Yahya Sinwar be taken alive? I kind of doubt it. Uh, I, I think Israel would love to take him alive, but uh, e either way, they're kind of, you know, if you kill him, then you make him a martyr. If you don't kill him, then you give the uh, Palestinians a reason to try to take more hostages. One of the things that, the, that Hamas is saying right now is that uh, if we release any more Israeli hostages, then we have to have all of our Palestinian prisoners back, which would be like, 10,000 prisoners or something would be ridiculous, and Israel's not going to do that. Um, can Israel have control over all the funds uh, people will try to rebuild Gaza with? Not likely. Not likely. Most of that, uh, those funds are probably going to be given to the Palestinian people, and um, that's not a good thing. How many work, working dogs does the IDF have, and how do they use them? I don't know how many they have, but they use them to, to uh, draw out, basically they recon with the dog. So they put, if they have a tunnel, if, if they send a guy down the tunnel, I just put a video up on chuckholton.com today of the IDF going through a tunnel uh, and it's scary. Like imagine being the guy in the front going through that tunnel because all the Hamas guys would have to do is fire. They wouldn't even have to aim. They just fire down the tunnel. It's only this wide and the bullets are going to hit you. Um, and so they could fire from even around the corner and the bullets would ricochet all over the place. It'd be really bad. So what they do is they send dogs down the tunnels uh, and it's terrible if the dogs get killed, but it's not as terrible as if a, if a, as if a person gets killed. So um, they use them for, you know, they put a camera on them, they send them, run down the tunnel and they come back <coughs> and they, they look at what the dog saw on the camera and they know what they're going to face when they go around that corner or whatever. Uh, they also use it to uh, sniff out explosives, bodies, money, stuff like that. Um, and I don't, But I don't know how many they have. Can Israel not police the aid coming into Gaza? They're trying to, but it's a tremendous amount of aid. And the best they can do is sort of spot check the aid that's coming in uh, through Israel. And, you know, it, it's very, very difficult for them to do. So it is possible that there's contraband coming in with the aid. Um, I don't know how likely it is, but it is possible. Okay, when will Ukraine finally get the F-16s they desperately need? Uh, I think only Joe Biden can answer that question. Uh, okay, why no aid for Israel? Well, Israel's getting aid. Uh, they're, they're getting some. Okay. Is regrouping losing? Uh, Jeremiah, very likely regrouping would look like losing. It would, uh, unfortunately. That's, uh, uh, again, those pressures being what they are, every time they have a humanitarian uh, pause, the pressures all ramp up on them, the economic pressure, the diplomatic pressure, the international pressure, the public pressure, the, I mean, everything just continues to ramp up on them. And at some point they're not gonna be able to restart. And so yes, it does look like losing. 
Why don't the Palestinians create their own state? They've been offered their own state seven different times and they've turned it down every time. That's why. Um, what about Iceland? Uh, let's not talk about Iceland right now. Uh, do we have any updates on Sinwar and Mossad narrowing them down? They are killing more of the leadership uh, as the days go by, but they have not killed or captured Sinwar yet. And I'm told that there hasn't been a lot of contact with Sinwar because all of the internet and uh, phone lines and everything are down in Gaza at the moment. Are the IDF holding ground as they take, working their way south? Uh, they are. They are holding the ground that they take, but it's difficult because of all the tunnels. So area that they've taken, all of a sudden because, that they thought was clear becomes not clear because somebody pops up out of a tunnel and starts shooting at them again. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, hello, Sean from Virginia. Denia wants me to say hello, and he's reading my books, Making Men and a More Elite Soldier. Fantastic. I'm glad you're reading those books, Sean, and I hope you enjoy them. Send me an email at uh, hotzoneholton at gmail.com and tell me what you think of the books after you get done reading them. Do people know how much Israel has contributed to modern technology, such as a cell phone? Mm, some people do. Uh, it sounds like the younger you get in the United States, the less you know about anything, especially about the truth of what's going on in Israel. Uh, if Russia can veto the UN, why can't the U.S. for Israel? The U.S. has been uh, vetoing these. Uh, that's the only reason that they haven't passed a ceasefire uh, resolution in the U.N. Security Council is that the U.S. has been vetoing those. But at some point, the U.S. might stop vetoing them and then Israel's in trouble. Uh, where's all the dirt gone that Hamas has brought up from the tunnel? A lot of people ask that. I went down there and reported on this like seven years ago, and you could see them dumping dirt all over outside Gaza City. So I went down to the border of Gaza, and you could look into Gaza from Starot. You could see them, dump trucks coming out and dumping dirt all over the place. So it was obvious. They weren't hiding it that they were making tunnels, and uh, they knew that. Why is Gaza relying on aid? Because they don't make anything, and they've used all of the money that they get to develop their military capability. Uh, yeah, if you're asking a question, please put them in all caps, and it helps to put the, um, the word question or to put at CBN News so that a little... A red thing comes up so I can see it's a question. All right. Um, it's, oh, we're, we're over an hour now. So uh, let's pray. And uh, is the underground made of clay? Well, they've, they've shored it up with cement. It's more made of sand. Um, you know, it's all beach. Gaza's one giant beach. And so uh, it's easy to dig in, but they, um, they shore it up with concrete. And they've imported enough concrete to build like six Burj Khalifa the biggest building on the planet. They, but six of those they could have built in Gaza for the amount of concrete they brought in, but it's all gone underground. Okay, and uh, today is the anniversary of uh, the, the 34th anniversary of the invasion of Panama. Uh, there's my uh, platoon, the Alpha Company 3rd of the 75th. Back in the day, this is back when we all wore OG 107s. Uh, it was like 1987, 88. Uh, and so I parachuted into Panama uh, 34 years ago this morning uh, in, during the invasion and uh, lost some good friends there. Uh, so uh, this is a day I like to remember and um, uh, honor my, my buddies that were there. So uh, we can talk about why the U.S. invaded Panama over on my channel so go over to Hot Zone Holton, uh, or go, go to the Hot Zone with Chuck Holton here on YouTube and subscribe over there, and we can talk about that on my channel. God bless you all. Let's uh, say a prayer, and we'll get out of here. Lord God, we want to pray every day for the peace of Israel. We want to bless Israel, Lord, because you promise us that those who bless Israel will be the blessed themselves. And Father, we know that blessing uh, is not as much uh, you giving us a bunch of nice stuff, you know, a nicer house or a nicer car or a nicer job, that blessing is your presence manifest in our lives. And 
we, we just thank you for that. We ask you that as we face difficulties in our own lives, uh, that you would be more and more real to us as all the stuff is taken away, and all the junk that comes between us and you would, would fade into the background and we would come to know you better. We pray that people in Israel would come to know you better through this difficulty that they're facing now. We pray for the soldiers that are on the front lines in Gaza, that you would protect them, send your angels to camp around them and rescue them, that you'd give them discernment and wisdom as they move through this moonscape of uh, what's left of Gaza, and you would help them to root out the evil that is there and destroy it, Father, once and for all, and that Israel would be able to be safe from her enemies, uh, protected by you, and that they would, they would credit you with that, Lord. We pray for the people who live in uh, the, the, in Judea and Samaria, the land that you gave to Israel, Father. We pray that you would protect them from the, the, those that hate them, that are all around them. They're surrounded by those who hate them, and they are often persecuted. We pray that the international pressure against them would fall flat, uh, and that um, it, you would not condemn the United States for those in the United States who curse Israel right now because there are more of us who bless Israel, Father, we pray. And Lord, we just pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we will see you again tomorrow. Please share this. Uh, yesterday's uh, podcast got uh, shadow banned or something. So if you haven't, please subscribe to CBN News. Please share this, uh, this video uh, right now, as, as soon as I end it, go hit the share button and share it on your Facebook, share it on your Twitter, share it everywhere uh, to get around YouTube trying to throttle the reach of these broadcasts uh, because more people need to know what's going on. So thank you for doing that. Please like and share.